Yeah. All right. So welcome, welcome again. So today's seminar is about, you know, we, we you know, we're using a very uh, extreme word, unveiling the secret, but it's really about how to enhance self-awareness for organizational management and performance. Now, everything you're gonna hear today, we're gonna explore today in this webinar is based on Orbinger's international bestsellers, Leadership and Self-Deception, The Anatomy of Peace, and The Outward Mindset Book. Okay, now I want to start by considering a question. Why is self-awareness important? Why is it important, right? And to answer this question, I'm going to tell you a story. In fact, I'm going to read a short story for you, okay? Now, a traveler was once on a road between two villages. He came upon an older man sitting beside the road and asked him what kind of people he would find in the next village he was headed toward. The older man asked him, what kind of people he had seen in the village he had just left? The traveler replied that they were not friendly people. They were stubborn, mean-spirited, and set in their ways. The older man nodded wisely and told him he would probably find the people in the next village exactly the same as these people. Now, sometime later, a second traveler was going on the same route or from one village to the other and he approached the older man a while later. He also asked what kind of people he would find in the village he was heading toward. The older man asked him what kind of people he had seen in the village he had just left. The traveler replied that they were friendly, filled with joy, they shared what they had, and set him on the way with, bless with their blessings. Again, the older man nodded wisely and told the traveler he would undoubtedly find the people in this village exactly the same too. Now, this is a very, very interesting story for me, you know, because what it's suggesting is our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. You know, it is often the best barometer for what is going on inside us, meaning what the experiences we are having constantly, consistently in the external world may actually be a reflection, a barometer for what is going within us. And for leaders, it becomes the best barometer for leadership ability. So what are we going to do now? So we need to unpack, unpack this claim. And by unpacking, I mean, I'm going to share with you two, two very strong reasons why we need to pay attention to self-awareness. Okay. Now, the first reason is the self-deception paradox. Now, here's the thing. In the company that we are all working in, right, whichever company you're from, results are key. There's no compromise. We have to be unapologetically focused on results. But here's the thing. The way we focus on results, the way we pursue them, the quality of results we produce is a function of a deeper problem. And this deeper problem is called the problem of self-deception. And the way philosophers explained it in universities, they use three points to explain it. And their explanation itself is a paradox. Let's look at the three points. The first point they said was, as people, we often create our own problems. Do you agree with this? A lot of problems we are creating, we have a role to play in it. Now, the second point, they said, as we often create problems, we also seem unaware that we create them. So think about it. I'm creating problems, but I seem unaware. I'm oblivious to this fact that I'm actually causing problems. So these two points seem to suggest that I'm blind. I cannot see. So now let's say I work with you, right? And you can see clearly I'm creating problems, but I seem unaware of it. I'm oblivious to this fact that I'm creating problems. Now, and you want to help me. So what strategy might come to your mind if you want to help me now? Well, you might sit me down and give me feedback, right? You might tell me off. Or you might say, no, this guy has to learn his own way. Let him fall and wake up, or, you know, wake up, right? Whatever you're doing, what are you trying to do? You're trying to remove the blindness. Now, in whatever way you help, am I receiving your help helpfully or you know, genuinely? Am I accepting your help all the time? A lot of times we don't accept the feedback of others, right? We become defensive, right? Right? We, we actively resist the ideas and the feedback of others. Why? Why do we need to resist? After all, the other person is trying to help me, right? Now, here's what philosophers said. There's only one reason you and I need to be defensive. They said we are defensive because 
at some level, we do know we are creating the problem. So our active resistance, our defensiveness is not actually suggesting blindness. It's actually suggesting sight. So it's a paradox, right? Can you see how it's a paradox self-deception? I'm blind and I can see at the same time. Now, how do you help a guy who's often creating problems, who seems unaware, but when you tell him, he doesn't want to agree. How do you help a guy like this? This is a problem of self-deception. Right? So in order to understand it, right, let's look at a real work-life example of how self-deception is playing up at work. So for, to do this, I want to share with you a, a situation that is happening between two departments in a particular company. And in this case, it's between the manufacturing division and the engineering division. Now, this is what engineering division does. They create designs difficult to manufacture. Now think about it. Do you think manufacturing is happy about this? They're not happy, right? So what this is what manufacturing sees in engineering. Hey, these guys, uh, they see themselves as prima donnas, you know. They're not practical at all. And because they have this view of engineering, what do they do now, right? They resist. They complain, give up, return designs angrily. Now, do you think engineering is happy about manufacturing's response? Of course not. So what do they see? They see manufacturing as being very uncreative and inflexible. Can you see a cycle going on here already? Now, if this is how engineering thinks of manufacturing, right? What are they going to do now? Are they going to become more helpful to engineering? Sorry, to manufacturing now? Unlikely, right? So this is what happened. They started to defend their designs and demand more creativity. And what did this trigger in manufacturing now? They started to see engineering as so stupid and uncooperative. And what do they do? They complain more and demanded different designs. And what did engineering see now? Well, these manufacturing guys are, are so uncooperative and lazy, you know. Can you see a cycle here? And this went round and round and round. So this is what we call in Orbinger a collusion, right? And it's very troubling because think about it. Let's explore some questions here. Now, in this story, in this situation, who's creating the problem? Who's creating the problem? You can just unmute and share. Who's creating the problem? En engineering. Is it only engineering? Or is it manufacturing as well? Both. Both, <laughs> both right? Both are creating the problem. Who thinks you're creating the problem? No one, right? Now, in this story, who needs to change? Both need to change, right? But who thinks they need to change? Opposite. Opposite. I'm thinking you need to change and you think I need to change. Now, now if that's the case, who's likely to change now? No one. No one, right? So how long might this go on then? No end. No end. Right, But here's the thing. But if you were to ask manufacturing, hey, guys, what do you want most in this relationship with engineering? What do you think manufacturing guys might say? Right? They might say, hey, we want what? A cooperative relationship, understanding, collaborative, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Now, same thing. You go and ask engineering, hey, guys, engineering, what do you want most in this relationship situation with engineering or manufacturing guys? What do you think the engineering guys might say? Same thing, right? A collaboration, respect, understanding, cooperation, etc. But here's the thing. Think about this. But the other ways both departments think of the other and respond to the other, inviting what they want? No. What is it inviting? Exactly the opposite. Can you see a problem here? Now, when you have a problem like this, where everything we are doing is inviting exactly the opposite. Now, what kind of solutions can we apply? Now, let's look at some traditional solutions people reflexively apply in a situation like this. Now, they might try to change the other person, right? Manufacturing might go to engineering and teach them, listen, you cannot be doing this, you know, you need to do it like this, you know. Will this work to solve the problem? Right? 
uh, they might do the best to cope with the other department. Will this solve the problem? Okay, what about leaving? Okay, I don't want to work with these guys. Will that work? Will that solve the problem? What about communicating, explaining, telling, teaching? Will that solve the problem? Right? What about implementing new skills or techniques? Oh, let me go for a training uh, on how to get this birth people to listen to me. Will that work? What about changing my behavior? Okay, okay, I'll do what you want. Will that solve the problem? Right? Will any of these ideas work? Something to think about, right? Now, so the chances are none of these solutions are going to work because they're all behavioral solutions. The problem we are talking about is a deeper problem. It is a problem of self-deception where both parties are creating problems. They seem unaware that they're creating problems and they're resisting the possibility that they might be a problem and they are fixated with how to fix the other person. So this is a classic example of self-deception at work. And the extent to which it is pervasive in organizations is mind-boggling. And that's why without self-awareness, there'll be massive value leakage happening in organizations. So this is the first reason, the problem of self-deception. Now, there is another reason why self-deception is important, and we'll come to it in a while. Okay, right? Now, and that is, what determines our influence? Now, as a leader, as an individual, it doesn't matter what role I play in the company, what title I hold, my effectiveness depends on the influence I bring in my role. Okay, so this is going to be critical. Now, let's try to understand influence. Now, to understand influence, we need to talk about the research that was done on self deception. Now, when philosophers in universities like Oxford, Harvard, Yale, they started working on this problem, their research revealed two distinct mindsets that shape human experience and interaction. Okay, let's explore what these two mindsets are. Now, we call them in Arbinger, the inward and the outward mindset, in the box or out of the box. Now, let's, let me quickly give you an introduction. Now, let's say I'm operating with an inward mindset. When I'm operating with an inward mindset, others don't matter like I matter. But I still have to work with you, right? You're still there in my life. But because you don't matter to me, your needs, your challenges, your objectives, your burdens also don't really matter to me. That means my objectives and behaviors, you know, are totally self-focused. That's why the red solid triangle is pointing toward me. That means who are you to me now? You're an object, an object of value. So here's the first point. Right? Whenever we are operating with an inward mindset, the emotional and cognitive programming coding is like this. I can only see the world around me, the people around me, in terms of what value do you have for me? It's all about value. If you're useful to me, I see you as a vehicle I can use. If you're making my life difficult, I see you as an obstacle to blame. But if what you do has no real value for me, I see you as an irrelevancy to ignore. Just look at the programming, the emotional and cognitive programming when we are operating with an inward mindset. So this is one way we show up moment to moment. Another way we show up is what we call the outward mindset or being out of the box. And when I'm showing up with an outward mindset, others matter like I matter. Others are people to me. And because you're a person, your needs, your goals, your challenges matter to me. And therefore, my objectives and behaviors take others into account. I am not doing a job for you. That's not my job. But I'm going to do my job in a way that is mindful of any impact it might have on you. So the summary is this. Look at the world I operate in when I have an inward mindset. It's all about me, I, myself. It's totally self-focused. But look at the world I naturally operate in when I have an outward mindset. It is inclusive. I take others into account. So two mindsets. Now, what has this got to do with influence? Now, let's explore that. And to explore this, I'm going to show you a little video clip, right? And the person you're going to watch is Justin Wheeler. He's the CEO of Berkadia. And through his story, we can explore the importance of mindset and the relationship between mindset and influence. Here we go. Oh, 
grew up in a very, very small town in Idaho. Grew up on a farm. My graduating class had 38 people in it, and most of us couldn't read or write uh, when we graduated. And I had a, a football coach who was like a 55-year-old guy, had been a Division I uh, heavyweight college wrestling champion, like a true, you know, gruff guy. And I played football for him, and he was mean and he was grumpy and he was you know he'd yell at me and tell me you know Wheeler dropped the piano you know because I was so slow and he would you know tell me he's gonna pull my eyelashes off. I mean just got all this kind of stuff that you can't do anymore in schools today right um, but I loved him I loved him and I would run through walls for him right but very tough style very difficult to you know it wasn't warm and fuzzy That same, during my high school years, I also had a basketball coach, 30-year-old guy who thought at some point he was gonna be coaching the Boston Celtics, who had almost the same style. You know, Wheeler, you need to learn to drill with your left hand. Why can't you jump, you know, sit down, you know, all these kind of th really mean things that he would do, and I hated him. And I, for, for a long time, I couldn't understand why that was. Why could one person who had very tough behavior and a tough style I would love, and why would it be the other person that I would, you know, that I would really kind of detest? And the answer really came down to the mindset when I think about it. My first coach saw me as a person and what he was trying to do was raise good young men. My second coach saw me as a vehicle or an obstacle to his ultimate goal of coaching the Boston Celtics. And so that came through so clearly to me even as a 16 year old boy. Even as a 16 year old, Justin could tell when he was being seen as a person and when he wasn't. Even though the behavior of his two coaches was the same. So you can't say, to be a great leader, act like the football coach, not the basketball coach. You can't say that because their behaviors were the same. Both these coaches were tough. Both were hard in their behavior. But their influence was completely different because of their mindset, how they saw Justin influence and leadership and effectiveness with people, none of these are simply a matter of skills or techniques. Others generally respond to us in the way they do, not because of our behavioral style, whether we exhibit hard or soft behavior, they respond to the way we see them. And we can't hide how we see others. No matter what we are doing on the surface, people can usually tell how we see them. What are your thoughts listening to that video? What has been your experience? What do you respond to? What do you think others respond to? Would love to hear some of your thoughts. You can just unmute and share. Do you agree with this, that people primarily respond to our mindset? Now, just think about it. Let's say I say sorry to you, but I don't mean it. Somehow, can you tell that I didn't mean it? Yes, we yeah. respond to the mindset. Yeah. Let's say I say thank you to you, but I don't really mean it. Somehow, most of the time, are you able to tell that I didn't mean it? Right? So, something to think about, right? So, here's a very, very important principle for influence and culture change. People primarily respond to our mindset, how we regard them, not our behaviors. And the more we understand this principle, the more we test it out and grow in our confidence, conviction for this principle, the way we interact with people dramatically starts to shift, strengthen. Influence starts to get better and better and better as well. So there are two reasons that we need to keep in mind why self-awareness awareness is so critical for our personal effectiveness, as well as organizational effectiveness. So to summarize, our leadership effectiveness in anything we do is a function of how we are with others. Are we with them, seeing them as objects, or are we with them, seeing them as people? And a couple more quotes. However correct our behaviors and actions may be, if done with an inward mindset, they are likely to invite resistance. Okay? Right? So, without self-awareness, both individual and collective, the solutions we implement may not be effective and in the worst case scenario, fail. 
This is something that sometimes we deal with huh, when we are working with client organizations. Senthil, you tell me what I'm doing wrong. This is how I'm engaging this particular colleague of mine. Tell me, what is wrong with my behaviors? And it'll be very clear there's nothing wrong with their behaviors, doing all the right behaviors, but they're not getting the kind of response they are looking for. And when we work with them, they, it starts to dawn on them. When the self-awareness starts to kick in, they realize while they are doing all the right behaviors, their mindset was not in the right place. Something to think about. So we've established a case for self-awareness. Two reasons, right? One is influence. The other one is the self-deception paradox. So how can we strengthen self-awareness? Okay. Now, before we get into that topic, I'd love to ask you, you can either unmute and share or just type in the chat box. What do you think? What, what, when you think of self-awareness, right? Strategies, what comes to your mind? What do you think we can do in the workplace that can help heighten self-awareness among our people. Just type your thoughts in the chat box or just unmute and share your idea. We want to hear you. So I'm just going to pause for a while. Get feedback from others, Eileen says. What else? Any other thoughts? Feedback is a great idea. What else? Or be open to criticism, self-reflected times. What else? Anybody else? You can just unmute and share. Red flags, Nico said. Okay. Now, all right. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to just share with you. When people think of self-awareness, what usually comes to people's mind? The conventional ways of thinking about self-awareness, right? When we ask, when we go to organizations and say, okay, what are your self-awareness strategies, right? These are what they typically say. Oh, we have 360-degree feedback. We do assessments. We have profiling tests, personality tests. We do coaching, counseling. We have reflective conversations. We have storytelling and more. Now, just look at all these strategies, right? Now, what do they all have in common? They all have something in common. You know, and to actually put it another way, right? They are all outside looking in strategies, meaning all these strategies, the thing that they have in common is this. Others or something else is telling them where they need to change. It's outside looking in. But there is a problem with all these strategies with regard to self-awareness and mindset change. Because mindset change is an individual choice. An outside looking in approach where I am told where I need to change is not the most effective strategy. Why? Because ownership is not sufficiently invited. What we need is something else totally. What we need is an inside looking in strategy. Right? Now, what can we do about this? Now, of course, for example, we can do things like uh, coaching, counseling, reflective conversation, storytelling. You notice these two bullet points appear in outside looking in as well. Why? Because if not done correctly, they are ineffective. There's a way to do coaching, counseling, reflective conversation, storytelling, which invites people to look at the mirror. So we need to be very mindful. So if you already have implemented coaching, counseling, reflective conversations and storytelling, and it is not inviting more self-awareness, you need to audit how exactly are you doing it because there might be a problem in the way it is being executed. But what Orbinger does is something additional. And we find this very, very effective. We actually help people understand the two mindsets. We help them understand the science of mindset, meaning how they move from an outward to an inward mindset, how they get stuck in an inward mindset, how they invite others into the inward mindset, et cetera, et cetera. And then we also help them learn and experience how to work with an outward mindset. And when we start to teach all these things, when we give them a language for inside looking in, the, you know, they are able to look at the mirror every day, right? What happens is we enable moment to moment self-awareness. This is very powerful. Then if you complement the inside looking in strategy with an outside looking in strategy, it becomes even more effective. Okay, all right. So now 
think about it. So we've talked about what we need to do have to have a very effective self-awareness strategy. We need to do an audit to check, number one, whether our strategy is primarily outside looking in or inside looking in. We need to be more inside looking in. The second is, if you already have storytelling, counseling, coaching, reflective conversations, and they are not working well enough, you need to do an audit to check how it is being done and see whether it needs to be strengthened. Okay, these are some ideas for you. Now, then the next question is, how do we know we have an effective self-awareness strategy? What will be the outcome if we have a good self-awareness strategy? Well, very, very interesting. This is the outcome we notice, right? If you have a good self-awareness strategy, by strengthening self-awareness, we end up inviting people to feel deeply responsible for their impact on others and deepen their conviction to become more helpful. So this is an acid test. If this is happening in your company, that means your self-awareness strategy is a pretty good strategy. Keep it up and keep strengthening it. But if you notice with all the self-awareness, this is not happening. You need to do a fundamental audit of your self-awareness strategy. It has to be weaved in every single day in the way you run your meetings, the way you have discussions. Self-awareness cannot be left to chance. And if you do have a good strategy, Imagine if everyone in your organization is seeking ways to contribute to other people's success, what becomes possible, okay? So this is what we are striving for with a self-awareness strategy, okay, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm just looking at the chat box. Uh, so Veena, you said be vulnerable and start from ourselves, fantastic. That's an inside looking at strategy, right? And Sijun said, sometimes storytelling when not done right feels like teaching and lecturing and worst case scenario showing off. Fantastic insight. And that is why uh, if your storytelling, reflective conversations are not working, please do an audit because it might be outside looking in, you know, and it's not working, right? It needs to be, uh, an audit needs to be done to make sure you are doing storytelling and reflective conversations the right way. All right. So, what self-awareness does, you know, we talked about, right? So now let me share with you a video now. And we're going to show you a video. And the person we're going to watch, this person is from NUHS, right? And she's going to share her own experience, you know, and what happened to her when she thought of her children, when she had self-awareness with an inside looking in approach. Here we go. When I went through the Outward Mindset program, I remember this one video that struck me the hardest. This was uh, Eric's story about his personal red flags and how it might potentially harm his family and how he thought he was being protective of them and doing all the right things. Well, it got me reminded of how I treat my three kids at home. I always see myself as a tiger mom. I scream at them often and nag at them especially when things are not on my schedule. When I open my gates, the first thing that comes out of me, have you showered? Why are you not showered? Have you completed your homework? Why are you still eating so slowly? Why didn't you keep your own toys? Why are you still not in bed by this time? The day right after I was introduced to the Outward Mindset concept and video, I went home and nothing changed. It was back to my routine. I opened my house door. The floor was filled with cooking toys, Lego and blocks and books. And I saw my eldest daughter was jumping on the sofa and screaming. My son and eldest daughter was fighting with each other and their dinner was left unfinished on the table. I necked at them, I screamed at them. I was totally out of my mind. Well, I, I then slowly walked into the shower and I tried to cool myself a little bit. I reflected and I, I realized that, hey, gosh, I ticked all the red flags just now. I didn't know when to change. I didn't know how to change. I became more self-aware to identify all the red flags that I just did. It's not easy to overcome that, especially when you have a schedule to meet, right? I have to consciously think that they are my babies close to my heart. 
how could I treat them in a way just like, you know, they are, they are just like irrelevant sometimes, especially when I'm on, I have a tight schedule to meet. When I see how my children react to my screaming and shouting, I saw my daughter cry and that triggered me to slow down my pace and chat with her and look at her as my daughter, my baby. Yeah. And um, it was really not easy because, uh, you know, as a busy mom, you have to struggle between work and housework. Change to me is, is very painful because it's, it's, it made me realise that I have ticked all the red flags and it made me realise that I'm actually quite a bad mother. From her perspective, you know, this mother was not able to spend time with me. She was always busy, she was always on her laptop. She always didn't look at me when she talked to me. After the lesson, when I start to practice and being able to identify all the red flags, I start to slow down and I had many chats with her at night ever since after the lesson. And I see the change in her. She starts to talk more to me. She starts to tell me more about her, her school. And then I realized that she was happier when she's with me. There was this, um, this, this night that they started to hug me and kiss me and said that, Mom, I love you. This has changed my life. An example of an inside looking in self-awareness, you know, a journey where, you know, Stacy was able to look at the mirror herself. You know, it wasn't easy. It never is, you know, and then shift her mindset. So I want to just close this part of the sharing by just sharing that here are some tools, right? So in, in with Orbinger, what we do is we try to neutralize the self-deception paradox as well as strength and influence by introducing very, very robust tools on self-awareness, the two mindsets, how we get into the inward mindset, what are some of the things that we are doing that is getting us stuck in the inward mindset? You know, how do we invite others into the inward mindset? You saw the collusion diagram just now between manufacturing and engineering, right? And what is the most important move? And of course, how can we strengthen coaching, counseling, reflective conversations and storytelling using the ideas, you know, that we have shared here. So all these tools are very powerful inside looking in self-awareness tools that can go a long way in strengthening effectiveness and performance in an organization. But here's the thing. Is self-awareness alone good enough? Right? Right. Now, it, it, it's, it's just one third of the equation. We need to see a complete strategy, a solution to actually enable mindset change for effectiveness and performance. So let's look at what the three components are. The first one, of course, is self-awareness. And we say radical self-awareness. The second piece that needs to come together to unlock potential and performance is actually we need to redefine accountability. And the third part is we need to enable collaboration. And when these three things come together, we naturally create a sweet spot, a workplace with independent, responsible, and impact-focused individuals pursuing hard results. This is what happens. Okay. Now, let's examine each one of these elements. Now, like we shared just now, the first half hour, you know, effective leadership, effectiveness is grounded in self-awareness. And we've already talked about that, so we don't need to revisit it again. Okay, now what is the second piece? The second piece is we need to redefine accountability. Now, this has a very, very critical role, meaning if you do not couple self-awareness with redefining accountability, it feels like you're le leaving people, you know, with a handicap, you know, it doesn't work well enough. So let's look at accountability now. Now, when we think about accountability, people typically show up in one of three ways. And we call them level one, level two, level three accountability. So level one accountability is like this. I only see problems. When I show up with level one, I only see problems. 
And what I do as a result is I blame my actions and poor performance on others and on circumstances. So this is one way we show up. Another way we show up in terms of accountability, we call it level two, I see responsibilities. Right? So let's say is one is my boss. I say, boss, tell me what you want me to do. Okay, no problem. I'll get it done. Right. So I hold myself accountable only for my own actions and performance. Now I could be affecting 10 others, but I'm not bothered about that. As far as I'm concerned, my boss told me to do something, I'll get it done. Why should it matter how I get it done? Even if it causes problems with others, that's not my problem. Right. So I'm only thinking about my responsibilities. We call this level two. And then you have level three accountability. Here I see impact. Now, when my boss is one gives me a job, not only am I determined to get it done, but I'm also mindful of the interdependencies in the ecosystem. And I want to make sure the way I go about doing my work and delivering my goals, I do not undermine the work of others. If at all, I make it easier for people to do their work. I'm not going to do their work for them. But my work and the way I do my work should not undermine the work of others. So here, I hold myself accountable for my own actions and performance and for my impact on others' actions and performance as well. So there are three levels of accountability. And the interesting thing is this, right? The type of accountability I exhibit actually reveals my mindset greatly. Very easy. It's a giveaway about our mindset. Because think about it. Let's say I'm operating with level one, level two accountability. Who am I primarily thinking about? myself, right? So what do we call this? The inward mindset of being in the box. And when I show up like this, what kind of culture environment do I create around me? It has people related problems. There'll be blindness, silos, blame, resistance, morale issues, all kinds of problems. People related problems, there are a thousand different manifestations. Whatever I'm attracting around me are a function of my inward mindset. Okay. On the other hand, let's say I show up with level three accountability. Who am I thinking about now? Everyone around me, we say we are impact focused. And this one, we call it the outward mindset or being out of the box. And when I show up like this, what do I create around me? Awareness, collaboration, accountability, engagement, innovation, etc. Remember the two people who are walking from one village to the other? So, our inner self, our mindset, you know, manifests our outside rea our outward reality as well. So what we are experiencing on the outside on an ongoing basis may be a very good indication that about our own mindset. Are we operating with an inward or an outward mindset? For me, that is absolutely very powerful. And you want to think about that for yourself as well. If you're noticing in certain relationships, right, it's a repeat, nothing is changing, right? And then we need to really go in with an, how am I showing up in these relationships? What is my mindset like in these relationships? Might be a very good place to start. Yeah. So this is about accountability. All right. Now, so if you look at the three levels of accountability now, so if we are showing up with level one, level two accountability. What will naturally happen in the environment will is this. Others, my boss and others, will end up holding me accountable. Meaning, they'll be, hey, uh, Kai will ask me, hey, Sentel, have you done this? Uh, my boss, Iswan, will ask me, Sentel, have you done it? They'll be holding me accountable because I'm prone to blame and giving excuses or causing problems for others. But if I'm showing up with level three accountability, then I'm holding myself accountable and I create a different reality around me. Okay, now keeping this in mind, right? So very, very important that we help people in a company, in our teams, leaders, rethink and reframe accountability, right? So that they can operate as level three people. So this becomes a very, very important strategy. Are we making sure when we give people jobs, when we define their responsibilities, are we making sure we are defining it in the way where they need to take into account their impact on everybody else around them? If we are not, we might be inadvertently setting them up to operate with level one, level two account. Now, what does Orbinger do in this space? Right? I'll share with you what we do. But before that, let's do a little uh, poll. Right? Let's do a little poll here. Now, I'd like to now invite you to think about this. Right? 
think of your own respective organizations, right? What is most pervasive in your organization? Are we ending up holding people accountable more or are we developing accountable people more? What do you think is happening more in your organization? You can just unmute and share or type in the chat box. What is happening more in your organization currently? Love to see some of your reflections and your sharing on the chat box. Mix, holding people accountable. Mostly. Does anybody else have a thought? You can just unmute and share if you want. We are holding people accountable. What if I don't see both? Eileen, I'd love to hear what you're seeing, right? What are you seeing in the organization, Eileen? Yeah. Pearl said, we are not holding people accountable. Uh, and you, uh, I think you meant that, you know, people are getting away, not doing their work, is it? Uh, is that what you meant, Pearl? I don't know whether, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether like accountable means like if there is a, a mistake or something is done, the person will not be more accountable in some ways. Mm -hmm. But um, projects are also taken away halfway through when you are doing it. Mm -hmm. Like as if they say that, or oh, because we are working as a team. Uh, so you don't feel that ownership too. Mm -hmm. So I don't see both. Okay, so that, that is even, uh, uh, you know, if, if I would grade them, right, you know, when things go wrong, you need to hold people accountable. But that's still a firefighting mode, right? Because somebody else is supervising you. What you really want is develop accountable people so that they are auto mode, they are running on their own, right? But if people are failing to do their job, but we are not even holding them accountable, that is even worse of a situation. Because that means uh, there's no consequence management, right? So there's no equity in the system. There are people who are working very hard. There are people who are slacking, not delivering anything, but there's no consequence. So that is a even more severe situation. Okay, yeah. Does that clarify? Yes, it does. Thank you. Right. Now, what if, we, if I don't see both, right, Eileen? If you're, if you're not seeing both, uh, it'd be great to... Of, you know, just do an audit and for the culture of your organization, right? Now, are they self-starters? Are they independent, responsible people? Or you're noticing like, you know, you're noticing a lot of things are not happening, you know, right? Because if things go wrong, we need, we need to hold people accountable. But that cannot be the culture of the organization. We need people to be independent, responsible, delivering or to more, right? That's what you want. That's developing accountable people, you know? So it'll be, I, I'm not sure how to respond to that, but it'll be great for you to actually go and do a reflection of what is happening, what is not happening, right? And uh, what is the consequence of that, okay? Uh, we tend to see the good in people, talk to them about situation, then move along, move along our merry way, like little consequences, okay? So that is an even more severe situation, right? Because... Uh, you know, then there's no equity in the system anymore because in a system where there are no consequences, the hard workers and the slackers, right, end up being treated the same way. And uh, that causes a cultural issue. Uh, Nicholas says, uh, we are doing both holding people accountable in the short term and when time is short, but developing people in the long run are fantastic. And that's exactly what we want to be doing. Nicholas, fantastic. Yeah. All right. And then you just need to figure out, okay, how can we strengthen uh, both, right? From an 80-20 rule, yeah, 80% of the time should be developing accountable people. And uh, we should only be dealing with the wrong things 20% or less of the time. So if you apply the 80-20 rule, uh, you just need to ask, am I spending 80% of time developing and accountable people? And am I only firefighting, dealing with problems 20% of the time, right? That's a good way to think about uh, your time allocation. Great. Thank you so much for your sharing. Yeah. Now let's push this, right? So in Arbinger, right, what we do is we actually, you know, introduce a whole suite of tools to be accountable, meaning not to hold people accountable, to be accountable. And to also, we have this framework called the 3A plus, where it helps us measure whether we are indeed holding ourselves accountable for level three accountability, right? And there's a whole suite of tools that support being outward in our accountability and being self-accountable, demonstrating level three. 
So this is the second piece, okay? Right? Now, the third piece is about relationships and influence, right? Which is about enabling collaboration. Now, here, right, if you think about the two mindsets, if I show up with an outward mindset, right, I'm naturally collaborative. It's authentic collaboration. But if I show up with an inward mindset, right, it's either false or superficial, or I have no choice but to do it, and so on, right? So you notice the mindset is going to determine the quality of collaboration. So there are ways in which we can strengthen collaboration. And, uh, and collaboration, right, if we are truly outward, we do not see it as an option. Individuals, when they are truly outward, they see it as a responsibility. Now, because why? Because you think about an organization, right? You, uh, it's similar. The good metaphor is actually a, company, uh, a, a human body. A human body has several organs. And they, there's so much interdependency. Each organ will affect other organs. Imagine one organ is just working and doesn't care about the other organs. We'll have problems. Similarly, in an organization, there are interdependence between each function, each department. So collaboration cannot be viewed from any other lens, but as a responsibility. It is not up for negotiation. It is not up for, you know, oh, I'm busy. I can't collaborate today. No, my business should invite me. Hey, I'm so busy. How do I make sure I don't drop the ball with my impact on this particular department and the way I do my work? Huh? It cannot be an option because that is what will invite more powerful innovation and creativity. Collaboration is a responsibility. And in Orbinger, right, we, we introduce a whole suite of tools, right, to make sure we can promote outward collaboration. So we've talked about three areas, right? We talked about radical self-awareness. We talked about redefining accountability. And we talked about collaboration. And with all the tools, what can we do? Right? And this is very important. If you truly want to strengthen effectiveness and performance and you know organizational culture, right? All these tools should al allow leaders, individuals to navigate real-time situations that they're dealing with on a daily basis. And typically, Arbinger identified 30 situations that people leaders typically deal with in their in the course of their work. It could be about selecting a new hire. It could be groups in conflict, poor alignment. You know, maybe someone is trying to do everything or someone is not doing enough or, you know, a lack of buy-in, you know, making a key business decision. It doesn't matter, right? Here are 30 typical situations that leaders grapple with, people grapple with at work. And what the tools around self-awareness, accountability and collaboration need to do is they need to empower and enable individuals and leaders to be able to successfully with an outward mindset, navigate all these situations, then you know we have arrived to a you know to a better place. Are there any questions you'll have at this point? You can unmute and share, or you can actually type in the chat box. All right. If not, right? Yeah. So the question then is. You know, what if there's a way to unleash our potential and strengthen leadership in 48 to 72 hours? Is that possible? The answer is yes. If we introduce a very, very good self-awareness strategy, you know, and you couple it with the right accountability strategy and the collaboration strategy. When those three things come together, you can kickstart another inflection and transformation performance yeah, within your teams. All right. Are there any questions you have at this point? I'm mindful of time as well. All right. If not, just quick, quick introduction to what Orbinger does, right? We focus on three areas. One is leadership development. This is our main focus area. This one is meant for people, leaders, and above. Then we have performance optimization. This is for every single employee in the company. And the third one is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, right? So these are the three areas that we focus on. And all these three areas, are the strategies that we introduce, right? The program that we, programs that we have for each of these areas is powered 
by the outward mindset strategy. Okay, that is what makes it very, very unique. Now, if you have not attended an Orbinger program or know what it is, you can either go look for the books, Leadership and Self-Deception, The Outward Mindset Book or The Anatomy of Peace, or you can actually consider coming for our public workshops, right? We have one in Singapore on the 20th and 21st of November, and another one in KL on the 4th and 5th of December, okay? Right now, you can also connect with Arbinger. Our email ID is here. We will also be sending you all an email after this, right? And then you can connect and better understand what we do. You can also connect with us so that we can better understand your situation, your mandate, your strategy, your challenges, and see whether we can, you know, support you in addressing your agenda. Are there any questions you have? At this point, it would be great to hear some of your thoughts. See, June, anything to add to this? No. All right, we have a quiet group today. All right, so we will send you an email. We will uh, send you an email with a summary of what we explored today. But just to recap, right? Self-awareness needs to be a deliberate strategy in organizations, you know? And if you already have one, please do an audit to check whether it's an outside looking in focus or an inside looking in focus and strengthen the inside looking in strategy. And if you already have storytelling, reflective conversations, counseling, coaching, just see, audit them to see whether they are indeed supporting an inside looking in approach to you know, what you're doing in the self-awareness. The next, review your accountability systems and see whether people are feeling accountable for their impact level three accountability. And the third one is just do a little sensing to see whether collaboration is viewed as an option or is it viewed as a responsibility? These will, you know, will be the basis of your strategy to strengthen the culture of your own team and the organization. All right, cool. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be here. If you have any questions, any, uh, you know, clarifications, we'll be more than happy to help. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here with us in this past one hour.